The Appalachian Trail is a formidable wilderness. Its vast forested stretches and magnificent mountain ranges are as serene as they are perilous. Hungry black bears, coyotes and venomous snakes lurk in its primeval depths. But just occasionally, a different type of monster is walking its paths, hungry for blood. Hi, welcome to the little shop of crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. Today's case was sent in from a viewer named Daryl. I wasn't familiar with it, but I was hooked as soon as I started researching it. It's it's a doozy. But first, a little shopkeeping. My name is Steve, and I offer exciting true crime cases each week, usually solved, but occasionally mysterious. So if that sounds like your thing, please do subscribe. And if you have any case suggestions yourself, drop them in the comments below. Okay, let's investigate. This is the shocking case of Randall Lee Smith. <laughs> The Appalachian Trail attracts thousands of keen hikers every year. It's basically the Everest for long distance walking, seen as somewhat of a rite of passage for dedicated hikers. And to say it's long is an understatement. The trail stretches almost 2,200 miles, or a little over 3,500 kilometers, from Georgia to Maine, with its winding routes passing through 14 states. Despite its dangerous wildlife, cliffs and rocky terrain, it's considered to be a safe way for explorers to escape their busy lives and to surround themselves with the tranquility of nature. There are accidents, of course, and occasional vandalism, but violent crime there is incredibly rare. Back in May of 1981, two experienced hikers, Robert Mountford and Susan Ramsey, both 27-year-old social workers from Maine, were walking the trail in order to raise money on behalf of a mental health charity. As they passed through an area of the trail known as Dismal Creek, a forested region in Virginia, they befriended a female rambler. They all agreed to meet later that day in a region near the small town of Perrysburg to grab a bite to eat and catch up. But when Robert and Susan failed to show up, the woman became concerned and reported the pair as missing. Deputy Sheriff Tom Lawson was tasked with investigating the disappearance. He and a couple of investigators attempted to retrace Robert and Susan's steps along the trail. On their travels, they asked a number of other hikers if they'd seen anybody matching the pair's description. One hiker told them that he'd seen them with what he described as a strange-looking man near Wapiti Shelter, a small log structure built the previous year. The officers stopped by a local country store by the name of Trent's to see if anybody there had any information. And it turned out the pair had stopped by on May 19th. According to some of the people in the store, a man had been going around boasting about knowing what had happened to the hikers. Sheriff Lawson asked for his name. Lying Randall was the response. Some nut job, he thought, and they moved on. Farther along the trail, the officers encountered a pair of hikers who had also seen Robert and Susan by the Wapiti shelter, and they too confirmed they were with a man who was apparently behaving very eerily. As time went on, hopes of finding them alive were dwindling. On May 30th, 11 days after the pair had been seen at Trent's, the sheriff and the investigators finally reached Wapiti shelter, but they could see nothing of value. That is, until Lawson looked down and spotted dark trails that had run between the floorboards. He inserted his knife into a gap between the boards and pulled it out. It was covered in blood. The sheriff and his men fanned out around the shelter, upturning rocks and logs and hacking at the thick brush. 
They came upon a small clearing, and there they noticed a conspicuous pile of leaves that looked deliberately formed, as if someone had tried to hide something. They began to dig beneath the pile, and they discovered a sleeping bag that contained something heavy. Inside was the body of Susan Ramsey. The following morning, the officers returned to the site with help. A cadaver dog trained to sniff out corpses. The dog pretty quickly picked up a scent and followed it a few hundred yards from the shelter, where it sat down by a small tree stump. Sheriff Lawson first thought the dog might be tired, but one of the investigators didn't agree, and so they started digging where the dog had sat. There they found another sleeping bag. This one contained the body of Robert Mountford, with a single gunshot wound in his head. Somebody had brutally murdered the charity hiking pair and buried them with their bare hands. Authorities closed a section of the trail and a murder investigation began immediately, with police desperate to uncover the killer before they struck again. Investigators created a likely profile. A local man with good knowledge of the neighbouring portions of the trail. Whoever did this had cunningly removed logbooks, the type hikers sign and date on their travels, from shelters for miles along the trail, making it difficult to piece together a timeline of Robert and Susan's movements before their deaths. The killer was sharp. The possessions of the murdered hikers were buried according to carefully planned compass points so they could be found again later. Autopsy results came back soon after the grisly discovery. Robert and Susan had shared a heavy meal and some rum shortly before their deaths. Robert had been shot in the head with a 22 caliber handgun. Susan had defensive wounds to her hands. It seems she had fought her killer fiercely. She had blunt force trauma to the head as well as stab wounds and 13 puncture wounds inflicted with a long nail. Investigators had found Susan's camera, hopeful it would yield some vital clues, but the film had been torn out. They did, however, also find her backpack. Inside was a paperback novel she'd been reading. On one of the pages they found a bloody fingerprint. It didn't belong to Susan or Robert. Police used the rudimentary computers of the time to attempt to find its owner. There was a match. They belonged to a man whose prints were taken during his time working at a nearby shipyard. His name was Randall Lee Smith. Randall Lee Smith was a peculiar man in his late twenties who lived with his mother in nearby Perisburg. His mother was withdrawn, making a modest income in a laundry room, and Smith was an only child. He was well known to be a loner, and someone who spent a great deal of his time exploring the Appalachian Trail, often for weeks at a time, taking solace in the privacy of nature, where he would diligently pick up litter and where he developed a lifelong hobby of collecting arrowheads. Throughout his childhood, Smith's mother dressed him in girls' clothing, for reasons she'd never divulge. I can only speculate on the psychological effect this had on him throughout school, where he was regularly bullied and never had a single friend. In a tight community where children would play and explore regularly together, Smith would remain alone. He developed a reclusive nature, which bled into his adulthood. He'd never have a love interest either. Smith was also known to be somewhat of a fantasist. He'd bragged to locals about wealth he didn't have, dubious adventures he'd never been on, and attractive lovers who didn't exist. He garnered the nickname L.R., an initialism that stood for Lying Randall. In reality, his home was worth less than $10,000 at the time, and he made little money from odd jobs and the occasional work provided by a local sympathetic mechanic. The only time he moved from Perisburg was a brief stint in Newport News, where he worked as a welder at the shipyard and where he provided his fingerprints, which proved to be his undoing. But he was always drawn back to nature, back to the Appalachian Trail. Smith was a drinker, an occasional drug user and a habitual liar, but he had no criminal record and there was no clear motive for the slayings. The sheriff and his men paid a visit to Smith's address. Nobody was home, but they had a warrant, so they broke in. In the basement, they found some of the hikers' possessions, some blood-soaked jeans, and an extensive collection of carefully laminated pornographic materials. 
but perhaps most disturbing was a collection of hospital instruments that had evidently been fashioned into makeshift toys. The officers also discovered a note scrawled by Randall himself. The note said that he'd been kidnapped by two people and was going to be killed, but the police saw through lying Randall's ploy immediately. Days passed by with no sign of Smith. Many believed he'd committed suicide or that his life had been claimed by the trail somehow. The officers hiked its pathways day after day looking for clues until they were exhausted. Lawson needed a break from the manhunt, so he took his family to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina in late June for a short vacation. Soon after he arrived, however, Lawson received a call from his office to inform him that a man had been arrested, a man they believed to be connected with the murder of Robert and Susan. But this man hadn't been captured in Virginia. In a bizarre twist of fate, he was apprehended in Myrtle Beach. Naturally, Sheriff Lawson rushed to see the individual. The man appeared weathered and he was covered in blotchy insect bites, the kind of bites a person might receive if they'd spent some time out on the Appalachian Trail. However, the man claimed to have amnesia. He couldn't even remember his mother's name, nor how he found himself to be at Myrtle Beach. But the sheriff knew this was Randall Lee Smith, and he hatched a cunning plan. Smith's insect bites were raw, and he'd scratched some of them so fiercely that they risked becoming infected. Lawson told him that they needed medical attention, and for this he'd have to sign a consent form. The moment the form was placed in front of him, he absent-mindedly scrawled out a name. Randall Lee Smith Smith, a 27-year-old man at the time, was extradited to Virginia charged with two counts of first-degree murder. It looked likely that he'd be put to death for the slayings. However, the prosecutor in the case wanted to avoid a trial altogether, because he believed the case against Smith was too weak given that there was no obvious motive. Very few people agreed, citing the extensive evidence against him. But the father of one of the hikers, Mountford Sr., was an Episcopalian minister and he was firmly against the death penalty. So he agreed to a plea bargain which the Ramsey family went along with. And so Smith pled guilty to two counts of second degree murder and was sentenced to two 15 year terms to run concurrently. This set his mandatory parole in a mere 15 years time. This reduced sentence caused fury in the local community, as well as more widespread outrage, particularly in the hiking community, many of whom picketed the courthouse shortly afterwards. By all accounts, Smith was a model inmate, and in 1996, after serving 15 years, he was released on mandatory parole. The first person convicted of murdering a hiker on the trail to ever walk free. During his time inside, he was only ever visited once by his own mother, but he'd go back to living in his childhood home with her in Perisburg, back to doing odd jobs and back to telling tall tales. His mother passed away in the year 2000, and Randall Lee Smith stayed in the house alone, somehow becoming even more of a recluse, living off the meagre inheritance she'd left. But the money ran out in March 2008 and Randall Lee Smith appeared to simply give up on life entirely. He took all of the photos down from his home, packed a few essentials, a few changes of clothing and his fishing gear, and he and his dog, Bo, simply walked off into the woods. Six weeks of mail would build up at his home and his water would long be cut off. Police put up posters all around town and opened a missing persons case. To the people of Perisburg, it seemed that this time Smith had vanished for good. The same year Randall Lee Smith vanished, a young girl, Meredith Emerson, was brutally murdered while walking the trail, in what is perhaps the most notorious case to occur there. This murder, however, was not committed by Smith, but by another monster. But for the most part, the trail is very safe, even for solo walkers. There's an unwritten code of friendliness, and hikers will almost always stop to chat with people they pass and offer food or water if it's needed. 
And that's exactly what happened later that same summer on May 6th when Scott Johnston and Sean Farmer were catching trout at their favourite fishing spot in an area known as Brushy Mountain. It was a perfect spring day and the trout had been biting keenly. All of a sudden the men noticed a hungry looking dog emerging from the woods, so skinny that its ribs protruded through its fur. The dog was soon followed by a middle aged man who waved at them with a smile and introduced himself as Ricky Williams. Ricky looked pale, gaunt and walked with a stoop. Following the etiquette of Appalachia, Scott and Sean happily invited Ricky to share a meal of fresh trout and beans with them, even grilling an extra fish for his dog. The campsite the three men sat by, Walnut Flats, was just a mile and a half from the Wapiti shelter, the place where Robert and Susan had been murdered back in 1981. The two men had fished and camped together along Dismal Creek since they were young boys. The three men chatted for several hours, during which time Ricky spouted an unbelievable biography, boasting of his enormous wealth, his honours from a top university, and the research papers he'd written for NASA. Scott and Sean humoured Ricky, assuming they were nothing but the fanciful tales of a homeless alcoholic. As darkness ate into the dusk, the two men began to worry the man might never leave. And if he did, the walk back to his own camp would be dangerous, even for an experienced woodsman, let alone an older man like Ricky. But just as the last of the spring light gave way to the obsidian black of night, Ricky stood up and beckoned his dog to follow. Come on, Bo. You see, Ricky Williams was not his real name. His name was Randall Lee Smith. He was no longer the portly keeper of the trail, but a frail and wizened 54-year-old who walked with a stoop. It seems that prison and the Appalachian winters had taken their toll on him. And as he eased himself up, he thanked his generous hosts for the meal, before pulling out the same 22 caliber pistol that had taken the life of Robert Mountford decades earlier. He fired two quick and loud shots, which cracked into the inky black of night, causing Bo to howl. The first bullet smashed into Sean's temple immediately, the second hit Scott in the neck. Smith then fired a third bullet point blank into Sean's chest, who staggered back but managed to stay on his feet. Scott attempted to run into the forest, but Smith chased him, firing a fourth bullet at the fleeing figure, which tore into his neck again, this time in the back. As Smith pursued Scott into the woods, Sean used the opportunity to stagger to his truck, which was just across some grass a few yards away. He climbed inside and looked to his left. Randall Smith was standing right by the driver's side of the truck. He raised the gun, pointed it at Sean's head, and pulled the trigger. The gun didn't fire. Smith was out of bullets. He began to reload the weapon and Sean gunned the truck, negotiating it out of the dense woods despite having a bullet wound in his head and chest. But just as he reached the nearby road, his headlights illuminated a figure standing right in the middle of it. But it wasn't Randall Lee Smith, it was Scott. He too had managed to survive being shot twice. Sean flung the passenger door open and Scott jumped in, holding a finger to his neck which was preventing a fountain of blood from squirting all over the interior. The men hurtled into the pitch blackness of the uneven road ahead. Sean trying to remain conscious enough to avoid the steep ditches either side as both men lost blood fast. They needed urgent medical attention, but the remote woods provided no cell reception and the nearest hospital was more than 30 miles away. And to make matters worse, Scott had left his truck behind with the keys still in the ignition, so they had the added worry that the murderer would likely be racing down the mountain road, chasing them, eager to finish the job. With a bullet lodged in his skull, Sean was drifting, and Scott periodically took the wheel to help. But each time he took his finger from his neck, blood sprayed ferociously from his wound. And then... They'd run the car straight into an embankment. Luckily they were able to get back onto the road though, and they continued on for five more miles, in minutes that felt like hours. 
Then they saw houses on the right. The first house was derelict. The second was dark. The third had lights. Scott leapt out and banged hard on the door, screaming for whoever was inside to call 911. At first, the homeowner, Melissa Miller, thought it was some type of home invasion. Eventually, she opened the door and screamed in shock. She shouted at her son Randy to fetch some towels and call 911. An ambulance was sent from Bland, a small town around 20 miles away. 20 minutes passed and the piles of blood-soaked towels got larger and larger. As time went on, it looked more and more likely that Melissa Miller was going to witness the death of two men right in front of her. Scott used her phone to call his mother for what he knew would be the last time. Eventually, the ambulance did arrive, accompanied by a police officer. Sean couldn't speak, his mouth was swollen and filled with blood. But Scott described their attacker, who sounded a lot like the guy on the missing persons poster at Trent's, just down the road. Randy rushed to grab it while the two fishermen received medical attention. The paramedics fought hard to prevent the two men from bleeding to death, but it seemed futile. As Scott was lifted into an ambulance, he was shown the picture. He stared faintly, blood seeping from the gauze on his neck, and he said he was 100% certain that was the man. The ambulance raced the two men to nearby fields, large enough for helicopters to land. They took Scott first, and he knew then that he didn't have long left. He thought of his fishing buddy's head injury, and how if his condition were more severe than a bullet to the head, his chances of survival were slim to none. As they took off, blood poured into his mouth, and he heard a woman tell the radio, I'm not sure he's going to make it. As the chopper approached the hospital, Scott thought he was already dead. But as it landed and the blast of cold air hit him, he knew he was still alive. Both men were immediately rushed in for emergency surgery. Both men would defy all odds, stare death in the face and make a full recovery, and were out of the hospital in around a week. They do of course bear the scars, both physically and mentally, of that terrifying evening on Brush Mountain. And later that night, a Virginia State Police officer was driving along Sugar Run Road, not far from Perrysburg, when he spotted a grey 2000 Ford Ranger pickup going in the other direction, matching the description of Scott's vehicle that had been taken from the scene of the attack just hours earlier. The trooper turned to follow the truck, and the driver attempted to speed off, but lost control almost immediately, before swerving off the road and flipping the vehicle onto its roof. The officer, Hamlin, a 58-year-old veteran, approached the truck with his flashlight on, which illuminated the 22 caliber handgun which was lying on the ceiling just above Smith's shoulder. It also illuminated the coldest eyes he'd apparently ever seen in more than 30 years on the job. Smith was in a bad way, and he was transported to Carillion Hospital in Roanoke, the very same hospital Scott and Sean were at, receiving treatment for wounds caused by him. Smith was kept at the hospital for three days, during which time he told police that he'd attacked Sean and Scott in self-defence. But on May 9th, he was transferred to the regional jail, charged with two counts of attempted capital murder, multiple firearms charges, as well as grand larceny in relation to the theft of Scott's truck. The following evening at 5pm on May 10th, 2008, a jail officer took Smith's dinner to his cell, but he didn't collect it. The officer called his name several times, but there was no response. When he opened the door, Smith was lying on the floor, unconscious. The officer radioed for help, but after an unsuccessful attempt to revive him, he was pronounced dead at 6.03pm, at the age of 54. Randall Lee Smith had no marks whatsoever, and there was no evidence of foul play. It seemed he'd simply slipped away, dying of natural causes. Around a dozen people attended Randall Lee Smith's funeral, the service for which was only announced following his burial, in order to avoid any protestation from angry locals. 
The whole thing lasted just 30 minutes. Smith was buried right beside his mother, and his dog Bo scratched at the dirt throughout the graveside ceremony. You'll likely be pleased to know that Bo was later adopted by a loving family, who walked him often and fed him well. The most disturbing aspect of this case is that there was no apparent motive to any of Smith's attacks. In fact, the people he met on the trail fed him, gave him warmth and showed him compassion, and he responded with fatal violence, taking the lives of two innocent hikers and forever changing the lives of two more. Thanks so much for spending your time here with me and watching this video in The Little Shop of Crime. I really do appreciate it. If you enjoyed this case, please do take a second to give the video a quick like, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss next week's case. Bye.